Hi there! Welcome to the 35th episode of the Synth Project, where we are building a synth together. In the last six episodes of the Synth Project series, we went through the design and the prototype testing of the five elements that compose the control voltage processor. The DC mixer, the sample and hold unit, the limitator unit, the glide unit and the LED-based voltmeter. It is now time to put together all these parts and build the final synth module. Let's start immediately. I designed the module case to host two CB processors, except for the voltmeter, which will be assembled only on one of the two PCBs. In the center of the front panel we have the column of the ten holes where the LEDs of the voltmeter will be located. Right below the LEDs there is the hole for the range switch and at the two sides of it there are the holes for the input and the through jacks. The panel components of the DC mixer will be located on the top of the panel, one on the left side of the LEDs and another one on the right side of the LEDs. There are three rows for this component. The first row is for the level controls, the second row is for the input jacks and the third row will have the output and inverse output jacks toward the center and the offset adjustment toward the edges of the panel. Right below the DC mixer we'll have the glide sub-panel which will contain from left to right on the left side and from right to left on the right side the input jack, the output jack, the time adjustment and the fast-slow switch. Below the glide we have the sample and hold unit disposed in two rows. On the upper row we have the input and output jacks and the on-off switch. On the second row we have the trigger and the trigger through jacks. Finally, on the last row of the panel, we have the limitator units, each with the input and output jacks and the bias potentiometer. On the top and bottom of the panel, we have a total of 8 holes to attach the module to the rack. From that, you can surely figure that this is going to be the biggest of the modules built so far. On the side panel, we have 4 holes to hold one of the two PCBs. The second PCB will sit on top of the first one using four spacers, and this is a change with respect to other double modules we have built in the past, where we have put the PCBs side to side. Since the PCB for the CV processor is relatively big, it wasn't possible to put two of them side by side, and so I put them one on top of the other. And here is the printed case, which just came out of the 3D printer. These are the holes for the stack of two PCBs, and here are the holes to attach the module to the synth rack. Since the panel is big and relatively complex, I decided to avoid printing a huge decal with all the drawings for the panel. Instead, I prepared independent decals to be cut out of the decal sheet and to be positioned one by one on the front panel. Note the big yellow decal which identifies the voltmeter and at the same time divides the panel in the left and the right sides to clearly isolate all the duplicated elements. These are the two PCBs where the two CV processors will be mounted. This one is the area where the mixer components will be assembled. This one on the bottom instead will be the part where the glider is built. This area is the limitator circuit, and this one is the voltmeter, which will be assembled only on one of the two PCBs. This area is the one for the sample and hold circuitry. And so we have one, two, three, four, and five elements all on the same PCB. This time, for the assembly of the PCB, since we have five totally independent circuits on the same PCB, I decided to mount them one at a time and test them right away before start mounting the next element. This procedure also helps in dividing the whole completion of the module in more than one video to avoid making them too long and therefore boring. And so, today, we will assemble and test the first element, the DC mixer circuit, leaving the other elements and the final installation and testing to later videos. Let's start with the DC mixer. I always start by putting first the mechanical components on the PCB, and that's because they are the ones that can withstand more stress, both thermal and mechanical. 
Then I move up in the scale with components that are less and less resistant, leaving the semiconductors last. In this case, however, this order is relative because I am not assembling the components all at once, but one circuit at a time, since they are all independent and I can test them as I go. Even so, it is always good practice to respect the order of robustness and sensitivity when assembling a PCB. Unfortunately, it looks like I made a mistake when designing the PCB. I put the two pin sockets too close to each other, and so I cannot leave the body of the socket on the PCB itself. It is not a big deal, however, since the module will sit firmly in the synth rack, and there won't be enough vibrations to unplug the connectors from the pins left on the board. So, to fix the problem, I soldiered one socket at a time, and after each socket was in place, I used my thin pliers to remove the body and leave on the board only the two pins correctly positioned. After I was done soldiering all the components, I inserted the IC into its socket, and the board was ready for testing. However, I still had to prepare the components that had to be connected to the board through cables and connectors. First of all, the potentiometers. For those, I first soldiered the wires on the potentiometers themselves. Then I braided the cables so they would not spread around in a perfect chaos. <laughs> Finally, I crimped the pins on the other end of the wires. These are the kind of pins that you crimp on the wires and then fit into the casing of a JST-XH connector. When you do so, just make sure that you insert the pins in the right order, otherwise the potentiometers will be connected wrongly to the PCB. Here are all the potentiometers ready to be connected to the PCB. There are three potentiometers that will be used for the level adjustment of the mixer inputs, and one potentiometer that adjusts the offset of the output signal. Each potentiometer terminates in a JST connector that will fit nicely in the corresponding socket on the PCB, like this. However, before installing the potentiometers on the PCB, it is better to check that all the connections are correct. Especially with the assembly of the pins, given that they are very small, it is easy to make a mistake causing the electrical connections to fail. So, to help test all the potentiometers and their connectors, I created this simple device. It has basically a number of JST sockets of different sizes, going from 2 pins up to 9 pins. These sockets are all connected in parallel on the back of the perf board and to one of the wires of this flat cable. Inserting a connector in one of the sockets makes all its pins easily accessible through these wires, and running a test on the component attached to the connector becomes very easy. Let's test these potentiometers one at a time, using this device and this multimeter. Let's plug the potentiometer into the 3-pin socket. For that socket, we will be using the first three wires of the flat cable. The central of these three wires is supposed to be connected to the cursor of the potentiometer. The blue wire attached to the potentiometers should correspond to the brown wire on the flat cable, and the green wire should correspond to the orange wire of the cable. Let's connect the multimeter, set it to measure ohms, then let's connect its two probes, one on the center wire and the other one on one of the two ends of the potentiometer. Let's turn the potentiometer all the way to one side. And now the multimeter reads 10K, which is in fact the value of the potentiometer itself. Now let's turn slowly the potentiometer toward the other end. And the reading, as expected, goes down until it reaches about 0 ohms at the other end. Let's now move the potentiometer back all the way to the left, and therefore we are back to 10K. Now we can test the remaining wire by moving the probe from one end to the other. And of course, now we read the opposite, or in other words, about 0 ohms. And once we rotate the potentiometer all the way to the right, the resistance starts going up until it reaches 10K. So, we can safely say that the potentiometer works and that the wiring of it and the 3-pin connector is fine too. The other three potentiometers can be tested the exact same way. Time now to test the circuit we mounted on the PCB, the DC mixer. 
I have already connected the four potentiometers, and I have also connected the first and second inputs of the mixer to the two outputs of my function generator. The instrument is set to provide on its first channel a signal with a frequency of 0.1 Hz in the form of a triangular wave 10 volts peak to peak, going from 0 to 10 volts and vice versa. The second channel instead provides a square signal at the same frequency of 0.1 Hz and same amplitude going from 0 to 10 volts. Using two different shaped signals will allow us to see how the interaction changes as a function of the level set by the input potentiometers of the mixer. The power supply is connected through this 4-pin connector attached to this perf board, to which I attach the four cables that go to the power supply, providing plus 12 volts, plus 5 volts and minus 12 volts with respect to the ground. And finally, the mixer output is connected to channel 1 of the oscilloscope, the yellow trace, and the inverted output is connected instead to channel 2, the blue trace, so we can see both of them at the same time and compare. So, let's take a look at the oscilloscope. And what we see now is a square wave, and that's because we have the level of input 2 set to max, while the level of input 1 is set to the minimum, which means no signal. Let's see now what happens on the oscilloscope when I start changing the signal levels through the potentiometers. First thing I'm going to do is to decrease the channel 2 level, and we see that the amplitude of the square wave decreases accordingly. Uh, let me adjust it now a little bit, so the signal is about 5 volts. So now we can clearly see that the output shows still a square wave, but at 5 volts peak to peak while the inverted output shows the inverted wave going though from 10 volts to 5 volts in the same interval. Now I am going to increase the level of channel 1, thus introducing the triangular wave on top of the square wave. And you can see the effect on the oscilloscope, which now shows the sum of the two signals weighted according to the selected levels. If I now remove entirely the square wave, setting to zero its level, we should see only the triangular wave. And there it is. Let's increase its level to the maximum. And now we can see the triangular wave to its full extent. Now I am decreasing the level of the triangular wave, so I can check the effect of the offset without saturating the output. So, uh, currently we go from 0 to 5 and vice versa. Now I increase the offset. And look what happens, the triangular wave at the output has shifted upward, and the inverted output instead has shifted downward. Now, increasing the offset a little more, and the shift increases. I now set into zero the level of the triangular wave, and we have a constant signal which is basically just the offset voltage. Now I am increasing the level of the square wave, and we can see its shape on the oscilloscope shifted by the offset. Now, just to make sure that the third input works correctly, I'm going to move the square signal from input 2 to input 3. And since the level for this channel is currently set to 0, the only thing we see is the offset voltage. I'm increasing now the level, and we can see the square wave, finally. Increasing now the level of channel 1, and now we can see the two waves interacting with each other, basically their sum. So all in all, we can say that the DC mixer works perfectly. And now, since the video is already long enough, let's call the day and continue next time, where we will resume with the assembly of the sample and old circuitry and its testing. Besides all these assembly and installation procedures, I also plan to do an extensive review of what we have done so far with the synth, and use it as an excuse to play some interesting music with the modules that we already have. To avoid missing the next episodes of the series, as well as any other future video, 
Please remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and also make sure that you have your notifications enabled. See you soon in the next video and as usual, happy experiments!